Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Tim McGinnis. I'm a director of the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, SCARS. And this is our webinar series. I'm joined by Debbie Montgomery Johnson. Good morning, Debbie. How are you? Good morning, Dr. Tim. I'm great today. Thank you. And Debbie is also a director of SCARS. So we've got a couple of our management team and officers here with you today to bring up a very important topic. So what I'm going to do is I am going to bring up our PowerPoint presentation so we can get this off with a bang. So today's topic is money recovery or not. So before we begin, let me just say that the views of the speakers or presenters are not necessarily the views of the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, Inc., an incorporated nonprofit organization. SCARS is not responsible for the accuracy of any information provided during this presentation. The speakers are solely responsible for their comments and content. And as I mentioned, um, I am Dr. Tim McGinnis, and joining me is Debbie Montgomery Johnson, who is an entrepreneur, a motivational speaker par excellence, an author and publisher, a military veteran, specifically an Air Force veteran, and a victim herself, now survivor and thriver, and an advocate and supporter of victims' rights. Um, I myself am a technologist, a scientist, an anthropologist, and archaeologist. Uh, a Navy veteran, victims assistance provider, and global cybercrime expert. One of the things that makes SCARS unique is that not only are we partnered with government in very important ways, we are a victims, crime victims assistance, uh, assistance partner with the United States Department of Homeland Security, Cybercrime and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, we're also a partner of the Federal Trade Commission for reporting through their Sentinel Reporting Program. Um, we're registered with the Department of Justice and many, many other agencies around the world. And we support scam victims worldwide with partners and affiliates in more than 60 countries around the globe. So we're going to talk about money recovery or not. A subject that is near and dear to every victim. Now, there is, in fact, quite a bit of disinformation, misinformation, urban legends, and just flat out nonsense floating around out there about this topic. The truth is, money recovery is possible. Depending upon how it was sent, it's not easy. And speed matters extraordinarily in most cases. It also depends, in almost all cases, on you having reported this crime to your local police. Not to the FBI, not to the FTC, but to your local police, or if you don't live in the United States, to your national police force. Because without that police report and without that report number, you don't have proof of a crime. It's also highly dependent upon the transfer methods that you use. And we're going to go into that in quite a bit of detail. There are some things that are impossible. There are some things that are extraordinarily difficult. And there are some things that are pretty straightforward. Crypto is a special case, and we're going to go into that in a moment. And there are also government remission and refund programs that are in place. All right, speed matters. Report immediately. So let's talk about that for a second, Debbie. With every scam, there is a high degree of urgency and a time window in which you can do certain things relatively easy. And as time goes beyond that, it becomes more and more impossible. You yourself are a former banker. So you're familiar with 
things like doing a reversal or a chargeback on credit cards versus debit cards. In the case of debit cards, in most cases, you have to identify fraud within a couple of days for you to be reasonably certain to get your money back. In the case of a credit card, you typically have up to a month. The truth is the regulations allow for more time, but it really comes down to the willingness of the financial institution. Now, when we're talking about things which we'll go into in a minute, like bank wire transfers or even a Western Union transfer, you have to notify them immediately so there's a chance that they can claw it back. Well, if anything, this would be the impetus to get you to report because no matter how upset we are about it, as we said, if we wait... We'll never get the money back. But if we at least put the the information out there, there's a chance. It's rare sometimes, but speed in this case is of the essence. Right. So we strongly recommend that scam victims act immediately. The minute that you know it's a scam, go and visit your local police, file a police report, get a police report number, and go from there. I'd go from there to the bank. <laughs> well, exactly. So now one of the things that's really important, and you can take a day or two to do this, but carefully organize your records. This makes all the difference in having a chance to recover your money. Now, SCARS offers what we call our red book, which is your crime organizer to collect all of the information. Frankly, the book will take about five days to get to you if you order it, but we have on our website, romancescamsnow.com, in our article checklist for interacting with the police, much of the same information. So get your information organized to make a, a high quality report but the most important thing that matters is getting that police report number so you can immediately talk to your bank or financial institution's fraud department because there is no crime without a police report number. Oops. So as we said, report to your local police first. Don't report to the FBI first. Don't report to the FTC first. Report to your local police or your national police if you live outside the United States. That is your affidavit. It's your confirmation that a crime has occurred. In this particular case, Tim, they're not going to do anything with your bank records, but I had all of oh. mine in a three ring binder. So it was proof that this happened. So it, it just made me feel better to have them, but they wouldn't be interested in it. Well, you don't have to supply the police with all the proof. You can come back to them after they take the initial report and give them more evidence. What's most important is that you get that report in writing. And if they can't give it to you in writing, at least get the report number and the name and badge number of the officer so you can communicate to that to communicate that to your bank or financial institution. Now, sadly, an awful lot of victims, maybe 98%, maybe more, do not report these crimes to the police. And they run around in a panic trying to figure out how they're going to get their money back. And they will see advertisements, comments on anti-scam websites, offering money recovery services. The vast majority of these are complete and total scams. There are a few legitimate money recovery services, but they have to be licensed for the services that they're performing. If they claim to offer money recovery services, they must be licensed in that state or province as a private detective and have a private detective's license or a private investigation license. If they don't, then they're operating illegally and that is a scam too. Many people will charge you money 
even if they're a legitimate business. So for example, if you hire an attorney, understand that you're gonna have to pay a contingency fee. In, a, in other words, a percentage. There's nothing wrong with that. 70% of, of your money is better than 100% of none of your money. But just beware, everywhere is going to appear offers to get your money back and they're almost all scams. So be careful. All right, so what is possible depends on how the money was sent. This is the most critical component in deciding what is possible. But in all cases, it needs to be reported to the police and reported to the financial agency because you may have options that will become available as a result of your reporting. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's start with bank wire transfers. Now, Debbie, in your particular case, when your scam happened, um, you sent your money in what ways? From the beginning to end, I sent a small check. I sent um, about $12,000 in Western Union, and the rest of it was in bank transfers, wires through Bank of America and then banks overseas. So okay. the majority of the money was wire transfers. Did you get the money back from the check that you sent? To the dating site? No, oh, and I no, it wasn't sent to a scammer. It was no, it was sent to a dating yeah. site. No, I did not. That was just a test. Um, right. I did get some of the money back from Western Union, and when I approached the bank, they said absolutely not that I did it, and the money was gone. How so, soon um, after you discovered it was a scam did you report it to the bank? Fairly soon, but it had been over a two-year period, so. When the FBI told me that there was nothing they could do, and then I went to the bank, that's when the bank basically said, there's nothing they could do either, and shut me down. Were there any wire transfers that were within 30 days when you reported it to the bank? Okay. No. So time would have been of the essence, but I think after the FBI shut me down that even though I had been a banker, and it, that that's a whole nother story about how I don't feel that they did enough uh, due diligence from the fraud department. But no, when they said that- Let's remember this was 10 years ago too. It was, yeah. Things have changed a lot. Uh, but back then, especially being a banker, they're like, that was your fault. So. Well, so 10 years ago, the attitude in the financial industry was quite different. Mm -hmm. But, so I'm going to talk for a moment about how bank wire transfers actually work. Essentially, there's- typically five parties involved in a wire transfer. And this is using something called the SWIFT system, which was invented by the United States Treasury and the Federal Reserve System. So all SWIFT transactions, regardless of where they go in the world, funnel through the Federal Reserve System. It begins with a sending bank. This is your local bank that you go into to do a wire transfer. And they take money out of your account and they send a notification to the next upstream entity, which is a correspondent bank. Correspondent banks are the ones that interface directly with the Federal Reserve. And the correspondent bank has an account for your sender bank. In other words, your sender bank maintains a balance at the correspondent bank so that these transactions can go through without the necessity of physical money. The correspondent bank sends a notification to the Federal Reserve, same thing. Federal Reserve maintains a balance for the correspondent bank. Federal Reserve then sends it to another correspondent bank on the upstream side, on the receiving side. That bank then does the same thing to that local receiving bank and then they deposit money into the account that was identified in the transfer. Now, this whole process takes anything from an hour to a couple of days. It depends upon the relationships between the local bank and the correspondent bank in each particular country. 
and part of the system. But one of the things that most banks don't want to talk about is how this process actually works. Because the correspondent banks maintain vast amounts of money for their local banks, both the sending and the receiving. That money is sitting there. So it's kind of like saying your money didn't actually go anywhere. It just still is sitting in your bank, your local bank, until what's called a true up happens, uh, which is when the correspondents basically take money out and balance the account that belongs to that local bank. This creates an opportunity for the local bank to do what's called a clawback, to pull the wire transfer back. Now, according to Interpol in their wire transfer recovery kit that they make available to local law enforcement, unfortunately, local law enforcement isn't aware of very much about Interpol. Interpol is not a law enforcement agency. They're a an NGO. They're a non-governmental organization, just like SCARS is. They're kind of a nonprofit. And their job is to coordinate the flow of information to law enforcement around the world. So one of the things that they've developed is a kit that helps local law enforcement understand how to do a clawback up to a year after the transfer takes place. Most banks don't want to do this because if they claw it back, they're gonna lose. Because the money came out of their account in the correspondent bank, so they've gotta they've got to cover the loss. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is because Interpol says, yes, you can claw it back and give police tools, even if the police don't, you have a valid claim against the bank. So you should certainly explore complaints with state regulators, Federal Reserve, and others to help you get your money back and to get um, some satisfaction from your local bank. So in other words, you can write letters of complaint directly to the bank. They have to keep those on file and actually provide them to the state regulators of customer complaints. You can contact the state or provincial regulators. Um, for example, in the states, uh, each state has a, uh, a state banking or licensing commission. You can also complain directly. Consumers can complain directly to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve will very rapidly, usually within a day or two, Formally notify that bank of a complaint on file that they must address. Doesn't mean they're going to give you the money back, but it's bad news for the bank if those complaints accumulate. Um, and you can also explore litigation because if there are mechanisms that the bank could have legitimately used and they did not, well, you may have recourse. So, in the case of bank wire transfers, you need to do this rapidly, within a day, if possible. If you didn't report this for weeks or months, still report it and still do a complaint through the bank, the banking commissioners, et cetera, so that you have a record with your financial institution that this fraud took place. Because there may be other implications or consequences associated with that. One of which is that you may be looking at law enforcement looking at you for doing money laundering, or heaven forbid that the scammers are using part of their proceeds to fund terrorism. That's a separate crime in and of itself. So you've got to get that report done and everybody involved in the pipeline properly notified. Now, a variation on bank wire transfers are instant money transfers through services that partner with banks, such as Zelle. And there are a few others. Debbie, you yourself 
were sort of a victim of a Zell transfer gone bad. Can you share that a little bit? Yeah, this is actually a business transfer between a lawyer friend of mine and myself. Uh, it was $2,500 that I sent to her Zell account. Again, first time I'd done this. And it was her account had been attached to her phone number. Uh, and in, I guess you have to put email address in. But anyway, we, we sent it to her phone number. I sent the money to her phone number via Zelle. I have Zelle through uh, Bank of America. And so again, I trusted it because I work with Bank of America. I sent the money to her and she kept writing back saying, well, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And I had proof that I sent it to her. Well, it turns out that her phone number had been somehow attached to another client of hers, Zell account. So my money went directly into this other woman's account. And we contacted this other woman who, according to her, had gone into bankruptcy and she couldn't pay me back the money right away. And it was back and forth. And I think the most frustrating thing for me here is because I took action right away was to contact Zell which I couldn't do. There was no contact information at Bank of America and I couldn't find anything online. And it was very frustrating. And I, of course I had to still make good with the attorney that I was working with. So now I was out $5,000 instead of $2,500. Uh, and it was, it, it was excruciating trying to get that money back from that woman. And I never did get it all back, but it was yeah. it just, it left a bad taste in my mouth about instant transfers because I had done it again based on trust and, and trust in the bank and trust in this lawyer. And uh, and it turned out that you should really have the, your accounts. If you're going to do this, because I know a lot of people do, a lot of young folks do have it. No, set you shouldn't up. do it at all. Didn't do it at all. But if, if you are going to set it up with a an email address, not a phone number, because as Dr. Tim and I were talking, phone numbers can be transposed. You can lose your phone number, but somehow my attorney's phone number got attached to someone else's account and we couldn't do anything about that. Well, the reality of Zelle is, unfortunately, they're under quite a bit of scrutiny right now by state and federal regulators who are of the opinion that the bank is responsible for fraudulent transactions or error transactions that go through Zelle because the banks promote it and treat them as a full fully integrated component of their banking solutions. But the bottom line is that there is no way to recover money at this point in time from a Zell transaction short of litigation. Mm. Um, you can file a criminal complaint against the scammer, but you can't really file a criminal complaint against Zell. They did what you asked them to do. If you made a mistake and sent it to the wrong person, or if sometimes there's recourse on that, but if it was just a scammer, you're kind of out of luck on that unless you can force the bank to honor the loss. And there are mechanisms, which we've just talked about, and, and there are options available. So never forget, litigation is an option in these particular cases in most countries, uh, particularly in the United States, if it's a small enough amount, under 15,000 usually, you can do small claims. You don't need an attorney, it's a rapid process, and the banks are more often than not going to cave in rather than waste the time to send an attorney to small claims. But regardless, you have a right to recourse. Never forget that. Just do it quickly. <laughs> Again, goes back to the urgency. Now, don't freak out if you didn't report this crime in a timely fashion. And it's important that you report it no matter what. Because that may help in shutting down a scammer's access to that money transfer mechanism. Now, let's talk about the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is Western Union and MoneyGram. We're not going to talk about the remission and refund program here. We're just going to talk about Western Union and MoneyGram as transfer mechanisms. So the thing about Western Union and MoneyGram is they do what you tell them to do. And it's challenging because... 
the Federal Trade Commission sued them and Western Union settled for over $500 million and MoneyGram for over $100 million. So they've tightened up their processes significantly on the sender's side. Unfortunately, on the receiver's side, it continues to be somewhat the Wild West in the case of Western Union. Now, I will say that MoneyGram is more reliable and secure in the sense that their local partners around the world are mostly banks. So when it comes into a MoneyGram affiliate in whatever country, they're going to look at the identification from the standpoint of being a real financial institution. In other words, they're going to scrutinize it carefully. Western Union, on the other hand, uses affiliates that could be a gas station, it could be a 7-Eleven, it could be a massage parlor, it could be an internet cafe. And we all know that historically scammers have put not only mules in Western Union locations, actually in West Africa, but we've heard of cases where they were suspected of actually being the owner of the Western Union affiliate, owning a internet cafe, for example. It's our belief that Western Union never collects any proof of who it actually is delivered to. Hmm. They say, give this money to this person, and then it's up to the locals to make the determination if it was delivered to the right person or not. So Western Union is fraught with problems, potentially false identities and impersonations and who knows what. So... My recommendation is if you are ever going to send money to somebody, only use MoneyGram because it's a much more reliable service than Western Union is in the long run. Uh, but unfortunately, like with everything else, if you have sent money by one of these two mechanisms, you have to notify them very quickly because that money is going to be available within minutes. And if you're fortunate enough that the money hasn't been picked up, you can claw it back easily. They'll do that for you. Uh, you don't even have to have a police report. You just say uh, you believe this was fraud and you want a refund. And they'll do it. But you still should have your police report. And you should make the status of your Western Union refund request part of your extended police report. In other words, you should update the police when you know more information about who, where, and from when you're going to be able to recover money. Um, I think the unfortunate part of this all, Tim, is that typically, at least from in my uh, experience, I wasn't aware that it was a scam fast enough to call that any of this money back or to go to Western. Right. It, was, it was beyond that point. And right. all you know, for mine was two years. Now, some of these, if you find out within, you know, a week and then your 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 mind is in such a, a state that you can do this kind of stuff. You know, if, if I'd been aware of it, yeah, I might have done it a lot faster. I didn't know anything about this. So it was too but, late. So this the, is the, the other this reason why this matters so much is get your police report done. Notify Western Union or MoneyGram with the police report number. And what they will do is they will blacklist that person from using their network again. Mm -hmm. So you cut off a means by which a scammer was receiving their money. Um, that's a very effective thing to do if you really want to help save other victims. Turn off the spigot for the money that they're receiving. Force them to go to more difficult mechanisms. All right. Anything more you'd like to add about that, Debbie, on Western Union or MoneyGram? No, I wish I'd listened to my gut because as a banker, Western Union was not something I'd ever used before. And I just got this funny feeling from the very beginning. But again, there was always a plausible reason for using Western Union up at the beginning. And now there are, there are money limits. There was like $2,500 limit for that each transaction. And it was interesting because my scammer at the beginning would say, well, I need 5,000, so go to this place and get it, and then go to this place. Well, I found out that Western Union knows when you do more than one a day. So that, that 
doesn't work. So that was, that was a learning experience, but it was just something, even when I was, I was not even actually giving the name of my particular scammer, it was somebody else. And I questioned that. I'm like, why am I sending money to this long name? And he said, okay. it was a friend of his who was there local. That's the story. So just okay. again, beware. All right. So let's move on to the flat out impossible gift <laughs> One of the reasons why scammers still like gift cards is they're easily fungible. That means that the minute that you give them, that you buy the gift card and you give them the number off the back, they can immediately activate and use that gift card or sell it. And that's actually what they do is they post those numbers on the dark web and they may get 40 cents on the dollar mm -hmm. uh, for the gift card value but they can instantly turn it into cash. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get a gift card refund. So if you sent money in the form of gift cards, I'm sorry to say it is 99 and 20 decimal places impossible for you to get that money back. So you've sent the money and to be honest, you need to prepare yourself for the worst. Regardless of what hopes or opportunities there may be, and we encourage you to work every option and opportunity that there is, be prepared for the money not coming back. If you can accept that the money is not coming back and then you find a way in which to get it, that's a gift. On the other hand, if you are so attached to the concept that your money is coming back, you know it, and it doesn't, you'll be crushed again. So better to accept the money's not coming back, but keep all of your receipts and paperwork. Unfortunately, amateurs and instant experts and wannabes out there and scam hater groups Tell other victims, go ahead and delete and, and erase and throw everything away. Get it out of your mind, out of your sight. Never look at it again. Unfortunately, that's not intelligent. Keep everything. Throw it in a drawer. Don't look at it, but don't throw it away. Because the fact is, years may go by and new opportunities for recovering your money may come up like the FTC Western Union refund program that we're gonna talk about in a moment. So now let's talk about the possible, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. With cryptocurrency, it is possible to recover your money. Now repeat this with me. With cryptocurrency, it is possible to recover your money but you have to make the effort. It's not gonna happen magically. Your local police department has available to them tools, and one of the companies that provides them is Blockchain Intelligence Group, tools that they can use to trace the path of your cryptocurrency. Now this only applies if you sent the money from your own wallet or through a cryptocurrency ATM, this does not apply if you sent a bank wire transfer to some crypto company to have coins, cryptocurrency put into your wallet. So you have to know what your starting point was, the wallet identification or the crypto ATM. And as you can see in this trace diagram, it's able to be followed from transfer to wallet to wallet to wallet to where it ultimately ended up. And that means that once your police are aware of the final wallet, they can get a court order to seize that money and potentially moderately easily get it refunded back to you. Um, the nice thing about cryptocurrency blockchain is that all of these transactions happen in the public. 
So with each transaction, you see not only where it went, but where it came from. So this traceability is completely visible and transparent. You don't need to see necessarily the, the true human being identification on each of these wallets. All that matters, it doesn't matter how many hands it went through, the ultimate result is it was stolen property. And wherever it resides, it can be seized. And it's relatively straightforward. Uh, we have an acquaintance uh, who's a uh, assistant district attorney in California who does this on a very regular basis because these tools are provided by the task force that she interacts with. Not every local police department are using these tools or understand this process. SCARS is in discussions with an organization to help provide this tracing at no cost to the victim that you will be able to take into your local police department and say, Here, here's where my money is, here's who to talk to about how this process works, go get my money. We're a little ways away from that. But this is not a money recovery service. This is simply a process that allows you to identify and trace where your where your cryptocurrency and money has gone and give you the ability to seize the crypto in the final wallet and recover your money. Can I make a comment here? Yes. I was working with a woman here who had become a mule and she was sent funds in her bank instructed by the scammer to go and withdraw those funds and buy Bitcoin and send him the Bitcoin. This would be an important time for her or for someone in that position to make sure they report what happened because that could come back to them as being a source. Well. Correct? So. We went on the offense for her protection. Right, the victim or the mule? The mule, because she was originally a relationship victim and didn't have any more money. So now she was helping out her guy. Yeah. And then she came to me and we put a stop on it. But we did go to the police and I said, you need to go to the bank and let them know because you had received now stolen money and you've you've been the, the go-between some other victim and the scammers now. But it was in Bitcoin and she had no clue. This was a couple of years ago, no clue. These are two disconnected topics. Okay, well, it was still going through the bank and it would come back to her bank account. No, hold on, Debbie, you're you're off the rails, sorry. Okay, never mind. Bank issue is a completely separate issue. It's a bank wire transfer, that's all it is. I understand that, but she got the money and then withdrew it from her account. I understand that. So if she provided the wallet or the crypto ATM information to the police, they would be then able to use this process to trace it to the final wallet. Correct. The money didn't belong to her. She was laundering stolen money. Correct. So, yeah, but she would still be on the hook if she didn't report that she was part of it, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So that was the important part. She needed to say, this happened and I was part of it, but it wasn't, she was She was part of it. But but we need to, we need to break that down into three essentially unrelated components. Yeah, okay. The reporting no, as a money mule is about self-preservation. Oh yeah. She doesn't get a knock on the door where they arrest her for money laundering, bank fraud, and wire fraud, and other types of, of transactional frauds. So that's issue number one. Yep. Every money mule must report these to their police. That's their only way of avoiding prosecution. If you don't report yourself as, as being in the middle as a mule, hopefully unwittingly, then they're going to find you. There is no question that the victim at the other end is going to report you to the police. Mm -hmm. They're going to, the FBI or somebody is going to come knocking on the door eventually. And that's why we see hundreds of money mules 
being arrested because they didn't report it. So they can even be guilty of obstruction of justice by trying to hide evidence and destroy evidence. So that's not a good position for any victim to be in. Nope. Second is she received money through her own personal bank account and then withdrew it. That's income. That could also be subject to tax fraud because money mules don't report the money they receive on their taxes. And some of them receive very large amounts of money. Plus, that's bank fraud. Now, what will end up happening with that person, if they're not lucky, is they'll be permanently banned from the banking system. Mm. This is yeah, something that happens in certain countries. Yeah, they shut down the accounts. Well, shutting down the account is one thing. But there are, in fact, banking blacklists that people get added to where they can never get a bank account again. And then lastly was the crypto transaction. And the thing about it is you don't know where that money is ultimately going, for what purpose or to what entity. Because as you saw in the, in the let me go back there. Um, this particular transaction went through five different wallets. And likely as not, the first wallet was probably the cyber criminal himself. And then what he did was he liquidated that wallet to others who probably gave him cash. They liquidated to somebody else and it ended up in the hands of somebody else. And the benefit of these trace analysis is that that final wallet or those intermediate wallets will also show all of their other transactions. Now, you won't know who the victims are who's sending the money, only that they're receiving an awful lot of transactions into that wallet. And the good news is that even the local police can freeze the wallet and seize the money, which potentially could be given back to other victims if those victims come forward in the future. So this is a quite remarkable process that really has only come about in the last couple of years. So if some amateur anti-scam group says, no, you can never get your money back, they're full of crap. Because in the case of crypto, you can, as long as that money is sitting in a wallet someplace. And as analysis has shown, it turns out most of the time it is. Now, if the police will not do this for you, you can go and see a civil litigator because you can go through the civil litigative route to get a court order to, to freeze and seize that wallet as well. And then go through the hearing process to get your money recovered, even potentially against a John Doe uh, defendant. Now, we can't offer you legal advice, which is why we say that in order to contemplate any of these, you do need to speak with a local attorney uh, litigator who can aid you in money recovery in this way. All right, now last but not least, let's talk about the government remission and refund program. And there have been three major ones and one potentially coming up on the horizon. The major ones, Western Union phase one, uh, closed 2017. Uh, the money's been paid out. Western Union, or excuse me, MoneyGram, that is also closed uh, last year. No money, to the best of my knowledge, has been paid out of that. And Western Union opened a phase two, which closes this next, or actually this month, at the end of this month. So there's very little time. If you did not file your Western Union claim previously, you have less than 30 days to do it now. Walmart is one where the Federal Trade Commission is going after Walmart right now. Uh, no settlement has been reached, but it is anticipated for exactly the same issues with Western Union and MoneyGram. Um, so Debbie, you sent 
a sizable amount of your money through Western Union, correct? Yeah, about $14,000 total. And you signed up for the phase one round of Western Union. Did you get all of your money from that? I did not. I got all but $2,000. Even okay. though I had every piece of documentation available, which I sent in, the last transfer was declined with a letter saying there's no more recourse. Well, the, so until as we, right, as we have learned recently, and this is a conversation that's still taking place behind the scenes, um, there may be recourse. Regardless of what the administrators of the program say, there may still be recourse, and we're exploring that process. And when we have news to talk about it, we certainly will, because to the best of our awareness, the vast majority of people who could have made claims did not file claims, and that those people who did file claims, many, most, all, we don't know, did not receive all of their money. You certainly didn't receive all of your money. I didn't, which brings back a comment you made earlier about you know the documentation and throwing the receipts in a drawer. I found that for me, it was best to just suck it up and organize it, have it in a binder so that when we had to do the claim, I had everything in order and it was pretty anal. It was chronological by date and bank and everything else. But all I just had to pull it out and, and scan it and had it available to upload. So rather than just putting it away and forgetting about it in a disorganized manner, because then once you start to organize it, you're going to have to relive all that again and then try to figure it out. And it's so frustrating. I would say organize it now when it's fresh in your mind and then put it away. Right. And then bring it out later on. And, it, and it's so much easier just to go to a date in a sleeve, you know, in a three ring binder and a sleeve, have each transaction in its own sleeve. And I actually had them all numbered. It was ridiculous, but it was two years worth of documentation. But yesterday when we were talking about this and I could go back to that one uh, transaction that had been declined, I knew exactly where it was. I had all the documentation for it. And all I have to do now is rescan it and send it on. So now what you just said is the critical component, because particularly when you're dealing with Western Union, you might go to a local store and they print out your receipt on a cash register ribbon. And those, those ribbons or those tapes, so to speak, pieces of paper, they go bad after time. They do. They're usually thermal printed. And that means they'll turn solid black after a couple of years or in high humidity or heat. So they're not a permanent document. It's really important. Photograph it with your phone. That's a great way to do that. Uh, because then you've got the digital photograph of the receipt with the uh, money transfer control number, MTCM, TCN, um, who you sent it to, how much, when, all that. Photographs are, are perfectly valid records. Or you can use your scanner if you have one. Uh, but copy those receipts so that they become permanent that you can access them later on. Because if all you've got is a black strip of paper, it's not very useful as a proof of claim. The truth is that the administrators had access to Western Union transactions for a decade before the closure date. So they actually knew everybody who sent one. All they had to do was look it up. But regardless of that, what we found is what we didn't know was that actually the United States Post Office was administering the FTC's program, which makes very little sense other than it's related to something that happened in the Supreme Court earlier this year. Um, so it's really important that you keep these, but more importantly is if you sent money by MoneyGram during the time period indicated, and if you want to find out, go to romanscamsnow.com in the search field, put in MoneyGram and look for our article on the program or go to the FTC website and look for current refund programs. Either way, 
make sure that you apply for a refund uh, under the MoneyGram if you qualify. Phase two of Western Union, uh, details haven't been fully announced, but it appears that they spent less than half the money the first time around. So they still have a boatload, a couple hundred million left to put out, uh, which is very surprising because there should have been no reason why people like yourself, Debbie, didn't get 100% of your money back. Because mm -hmm. that was the, that was the uh, settlement that they didn't settle for 80 cents on the dollar. They settled that they were going to refund 100%. Okay. So again, as we said before, hope for your money back, but expect it not to come back. The most important thing after you do your reporting and tell your financial institutions is focus on your own personal recovery. Accept the situation, do all that you can Work each problem as you find it, but don't hold on to false hope because you just don't know. Do what you need to do, but remember, it might not be successful. But in the same way, let's go back to that for a second. In the same way, you know, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, Debbie, but I think it's important that each victim explore every avenue is available to them because that way when it's all said and done they're not left with a lot of what if questions well what if i just tried one more thing could i have gotten my money back i think it's important to turn over every stone even if it's frustrating because then you know that you did everything possible do you agree i agree because i mean 10 years ago like we said things were different today it's different and just to take control over the situation, you know, you may not get anything back, but just having the, just tr trying or striving to do your best to get it back because every little bit you get back is a win and it makes yeah. you feel good. And yeah, there are things that I wish, I, I wish I could have done. I should have, could have, uh, I didn't know. I mean, when I heard no at the bank, I took that as a no. I might not take that as a no today because no. you never know. It could change. Well, you, you should not because we have people in our support groups who, in fact, got money back from wire transfers a couple of months after the fact. Yeah. It just depends upon the institution and it depends upon how diligent the victim is. Um, all right. So, you know, as we always say, it's important not to blame yourself. This happened. It happened because you were because the victim was expertly manipulated. They were lured in, they were groomed, they were manipulated, and they were controlled in a process that works. Scammers wouldn't do it if it wasn't working. It wouldn't be a trillion dollar industry if it didn't work. So victims are not to blame. Remember to stay in control throughout this process while you're advocating for yourself when you're talking to the police and the financial institutions, et cetera, don't lose control to anger. Your expectations may be completely out of whack. They may not do what you want them to do. You don't have control of them, but getting angry only guarantees that you're going to get a negative result. Stay in control. Remember, report the crime. You can't recover anything without it. Every report matters. The police may not ch chase after these criminals, but the reports help the government to ex extradite them. Uh, just yesterday, a Russian money launderer to the tune of $88 million was extradited to the United States where he will stand trial for money laundering on behalf of organized criminal cartels. Reporting also helps you to restore your power and control. It also helps you to accept that you're the victim of a crime and are not to blame. Where to report? We have this plastered everywhere. Um, 
go to our victims checklist for interacting with the police on our romancescamsnow.com website. Uh, it's located on the homepage in the section for new victims. Report to your local, local police, get a report number, report to your financial institutions and give them that report number because that report number is proof that there was a crime. After you've done that, then you can report it to the FBI or the and or the Federal Trade Commission and to SCARS. But do those two things first, local police, then your financial institutions. And please keep your evidence. So many victims kicked themselves years down the road because they didn't keep the evidence. Remember, when you're talking to the police and your financial institutions, use the word fraud, not scam. Everybody understands the word fraud. Use the word criminal, not a scammer. They'll take you more seriously if you're using proper criminal terminology. Don't be hard on yourself or you're giving others permission to blame you too. Remember that. You're not to blame, feel no shame. When you report this, as we said, always call it fraud, never scam. Tell the police everything. But you can be selective with your financial institutions. They don't want to hear about all the dialogue or anything else. Frankly, neither do the police. But the point being is that your bank doesn't need to know anything except the individual transactions. They don't need to know any of the rest of the story. They'll get a copy of the police report if they need it. You should see our webinars on how to tell your story, which are available on romancescamsnow.com, on our social media pages, and on our YouTube channel. Stay in control emotionally. Have someone with you when you go to report this crime, or even when you get on the phone with your financial institution, have somebody sitting with you that can help support you emotionally. And once this is done, get help. That means focus on your own recovery. After this is all done, you may be very traumatized. We're here to help. We do offer do-it-yourself recovery and real professionally managed victim support groups. We also recommend that every victim see a trauma counselor or a therapist. You can find counselors at opencounseling.com or at psychologytoday.com and look for trauma counselors or therapists. Remember to be proud of yourself. You've discovered and ended this crime. Now stay focused on getting the, work, the rest of the work done, and that includes you. Ending a scam is kind of a superhero activity. It's extraordinarily hard. Debbie, do you want to add something here? All I can say is uh, through all these things, beware and be aware. Take your power back, stand up, speak about it. But again, have that buddy that will give you the encouragement to not do this alone. And we got lots of buddies here at SCARS and we're willing to be there for you. Absolutely. So focus on your own recovery. Um, as we said before, get yourself organized early after the scam ends. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is it will help accessing those records when you need to that much more easy and less traumatic than trying to put together a jumble of things that are completely disorganized. You can use our SCARS uh, Red Book to help you do that, uh, but we also offer the information free on our romancescamsnow.com. We also offer other books published by SCARS that are also available on our SCARS bookstore. Our Blue Book, which is a scam victims journal, our Green Book, which is a self-help recovery program, and many others. 100% of all profit goes to help SCARS help more scam victims 
worldwide. Your generous purchase of our publications allows us to maintain scam avoidance, support, and recovery services. Please help scam victims worldwide and stand proud. Just FYI, all SCARS staff members are volunteers. SCARS does not have any salaried positions, unlike other nonprofits. Um, everybody at SCARS is a volunteer themselves, and almost everybody is a scam victim, now survivor, as well. SCARS publishing books are available at shop.againstscams.org for you to take a look at what we offer. Remember, we are here to hear you. We're the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, Inc., SCARS, a government-registered crime victims assistance and crime prevention nonprofit organization providing support and recovery services to scam victims worldwide. We have 31 years of continuous experience in our team. We've helped more than 7 million scam victims through education, and avoidance information, and nearly 12,000 victims have gone through the SCARS recovery programs and support groups. We are not amateurs, we are experts. Our team, uh, we're proud to say that the majority of our team are certified advanced life coaches. We have certified grief counselors, certified cybersecurity professionals, um, psychologists, psychiatric uh, professionals as part of our organization, part of our advisors and board of directors. If you can help, please help. We're a nonprofit based in Miami, Florida. You can go to the state of Florida website and verify our nonprofit status. We encourage you to do that. But we need your help to provide free services that we offer scam victims worldwide. If you have the opportunity to donate, please donate. It's quick and easy and your generous gift will help us offer more services to more scam victims. If you choose to donate, you can donate at donate.againstscams.org. Remember, never again. We know that we can't get the public to always listen, but our objective is to make sure that you never get scammed again. So that's why we provide the education and the support and the informational tools such as this webinar. Please remember, SCARS is not a mental health care provider and does not provide counseling or therapy services. The statements or publications of our team are not intended to provide medical, legal, or financial advice. This is just a conversation between survivors and SCARS members. Any information provided or discussed is not intended to replace competent professional medical, legal, or financial advice. Consult a medical, psychological, legal, or financial professional before taking any actions or responding to any suggestions from others, including educational information provided by SCARS. Questions. If you have questions about today's webinar or about anything we do, Visit romancescamsnow.com, leave us a comment, or visit us on Facebook, search for SCARS or againstscams.org, and you'll find us everywhere. Uh, or send us an email to contact at againstscams.org. We're happy to hear and respond to your questions and comments. This webinar is copyright 2022 SCARS. Thank you for trusting us and listening to us today. So Debbie, any final thoughts on our webinar today? I think it's excellent. And the things that stuck out most to me were organize your documentation, have it ready, put it away once you've done that so you're not looking at it and re reminding yourself of it. Be a thriver. Survivors will always feel that they've got that that thing that happened to them hanging on them, move out of that, become a thriver, become an advocate, speak up so that others aren't going to be hurt. And as far as the reporting goes, time is of the essence and hopefully you'll get a little bit of money back, but don't count on it. Be grateful as the gift if it comes back, but just do everything you can to get control of what happened and, uh, and start your recovery. Great advice. 
Thank you so much for joining me today, uh, Debbie, and all of you who are watching this uh, video webinar. We appreciate your attention and we strive constantly to live up to the necessity of helping victims everywhere overcome and recover from this horrible experience. Um, thank you again, everyone, for, for watching us and we wish you the best in your recovery. We sincerely hope that you are successful in recovering some or all of your money and that you will apply the things that we provide uh, to your future improvement and, uh, and recovery. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye, Debbie.